the game is still with all of our best intentions, the kids kind of still play the game the same way yeah. until a really, a really talented kid comes around and plays it a little bit differently, but it's not because anybody taught him how to do it. He or she just does it because they're great athletes. You got a little of that on your nose. Yeah. <laughs> My wife would, <laughs> but, uh, You know, unfortunately, the um, you know the pressure to win is so great at younger ages that um, you know coaches won't, won't you know they won't get those one or two top players to share the puck because they can frequently, at least in our my experience. They, you know, they're going to do all the goal scoring for you. One or two guys will, or three, if you got, if you're lucky. And they don't want, they don't want those guys to be on the ice without the puck. And and or they put them all in the same line, and then they will share the puck. But the rest of the kids don't yeah. kind of learn anything out of it. And <clears throat> by the time these kids are 18 years old, they've had a hundred and some coaches. And the top end kids, you know, you know the same thing. I mean, when I had Wheeler, had a, had a couple other kids that were awful good, and they're before they got to me, the, their team game plan was get them the puck, let them go score goals, and which they could do at squirts and peewees and some and bantams. But when they went to the next level, it was a heck of a lot tougher. But it's not for those guys will adapt. It's the, set, it's the next group of kids, you know, have never learned, you know, they're never going to be that, that talented. So they need to play the game differently. And unfortunately, the coaches don't teach it to them. You get them at 16, 17, I, or 18. And Al, I got a question. What you just said is the root of the problem. Yeah. Because they're more talented. And I'm saying, and pardon my, English here, that's the error. We let the most talented players who are maybe have a better birth date, are paying extra yeah. money for time, um, dominate the play and have the puck all the time and get double shifted and get entitled growing up. They do right. not learn to play a team game. So Tom and Greg are on. Uh, Craig, I uh, welcome to the group. I'm really excited about this because Tom is on. I know, Tom, you're editing video as we speak. And I want you to pay attention here, Tom, because you watch the U-17, U-18, U-20, male and female hockey, and they appear to be doing the right things. And, Greg, their coaches were doing the right things. Your podcast is the right things, but it's at the level of the elite player and they still cannot execute it on the ice and I'm talking national team players U17 18 and 20 so my qu question is what's going on it's not that they're not talented enough in my opinion I have thoughts on it but I, I'd like to hear everybody else's thoughts. So go ahead, Hal, if you want. And Dominic is in Boston with Jordan. They're at a tournament with their female teams. So welcome, Dom. Thanks, Wally. Just okay. uh, driving around, but thank you. Okay, and Tim's just joined us. Great. So guys, um, I sent out an email. I don't know if you want to check it, but... In about three sentences, I explained why I was excited to have Tom on today. As as most of you know, he attends all the practices that Hockey Canada runs at Windsport. And I went to the U-17 girls and U-17 boys and one U-18 practice, and I was very impressed with what they did. Tom and I talked last night, 
What they did in practice was terrific, but they can't execute it yet in games. And that's, to me, the dilemma here. At least they're doing the right things at this age and level. But I'm, not, I'm just not sure what the secret is to making it simpler and getting it applied in game situations so that the they just become better players. I, I think we're really not very good, and it can be so much better. So it's open to everyone. Now, Hal, you mentioned what you said. Uh, some people might have joined late, but could you summarize what you said? Because that encapsulated the problem. And I, as I said to you, focus well, I'll restate it a little bit. Kids um, is the problem. You know, when you go to these national camps, you've got, you have the best, in theory, you've got the best players that come from all sorts of places. But, you know, they may play together for a little while, but not a long while. And then they return to where they came from, where they are likely the best player on the team or in the top two or three. So uh, Wally and I started a little early while he was having his breakfast. But, um, you know, in youth hockey, at least in Minnesota, you know, the pressure to win hockey games begins in mites. And then it What's progresses. Mites? Mites? Eight what and under. Guys in terms, sorry. <laughs> and then we get them in squirts, 10 and under. And they run off to the brick tournament in the summer. And everybody is all excited about winning that. and. They come back to their their local programs, and these upper end kids, you know, they dominate. They get lots of ice time. Uh, they get all the attention, and if they're on a top t team in their community, they get, in theory, the best coach. If they're on the next team down, they get the second best coach. Um, but winning is the is the holy grail. Not playing team hockey, not sharing the puck. Um, you know, <clears throat> you're ahead by seven and your, you know, your first line goes out on a power play in the last four minutes of the game. And there's, you know, a lot of the kids don't get a chance <clears throat> to do a lot of these other things. They don't. And then by the time, like when I get them, when they're 16 to 18, um, you know, they've had a hundred coaches maybe more, just in hockey. And then if they play other sports, they're getting, a, you know, they're getting some different messages. But I think the message is the same in, in all these sports. Get the ball, get the puck, get the whatever to the top player, and they'll help us win the game. And so we don't have uh, – and the other thing here in Minnesota is that <clears> – <throat> uh, Ice time, hard to believe that ice time would be a problem because every community has got two or three sheets of ice. Uh, we have two communities where I'm in one and I coach in the other one, and but between them there's three sheets of ice, which really isn't enough. Um, but teams are reluctant to practice. Instead of doing a joint practice, they'll go out and schedule a game because games are more fun. The parents like the games. They hate practice. No fun to watch. <laughs> All right, Hal. This is this is uh, hitting strong well, for me because I, I literally had a meeting ahead, last Greg, night. Huh? I, had some, I had a meeting last night with some fellow coaches at a program I'm helping out with, and the one guy was adamant. He's like, "You have to play games for these players because otherwise you're going to lose the parents and lose the kids." And I'm over here. I'm like, "Why can't we educate?" the parents further into the benefits like we'll still play some games but that would not be the stress point like these kids are playing jv hockey it's more about getting their skills advanced not watching your kid play jv hockey like they all want to play varsity it's about development and i literally ba basically uh gentlemen screaming match of us going back and forth very strongly being like how can you do this and i'm over here just in my own mind and saying it out loud of like 
these kids need more puck touches. They need more games. I'd rather play a three on three cross ice game than going to play the team across town. Like it just makes no sense to me. And he, and he just keeps harping on, well, the parents, this the parents that and I'm like, yes, but the focus should not be on the parents. It should be on the kid. And if they're having fun, then the parents will have plenty of fun with that. So uh, if anyone has experience with this, I'm all, all ears on getting someone to change their mind and come over to the, the light side. Well, the parents love games. I, I remember doing a one summer team years ago, a girls team. And we'd have a practice and I get there with my practice already. And there'd be another team there and the organizers that already are, you know, they had an exhibition game. And the girls were playing. We didn't hardly ever practiced. <laughs> it was just, it, it was useless hiring me because I mean, anybody could have just been there open on the, you know, open on the door. So that is a, for sure, is a mindset. Well, well you're definitely, definitely a battle. I I really wanted to argue against practice here for a minute, and I know that sounds like a radical thing, um, but it happened with me, and I've told the story many times, and I'm telling it now because. I'm going to edit this part out. I think this is the most valuable session that we've had. If it's about coaching and the level of player that you've got. And Craig, when I was asked to coach a Bantam AA team, uh, I was teaching phys ed, just finished playing with the national team, running a hockey school, running ice, ice with pro players in the evening. And I got asked to coach Bantam AA. Now that's AAA today, and I took on a team. <clears throat> I was had to select a team. It just happened the two teams in our area in Calgary played in the city final, so I had the pick of the litter. They won the cities the previous year playing each other, one of them, and I got asked to take the team, and I took it. I plan great practices. I think I can plan better practices now, but I would certainly have more game-like things now. So the story, Craig, reinforces this. In November, I was in fourth place with the best team. The kids were doing everything I wanted, trying to please me. And I was lost. I was going to quit. I didn't know what to do, but... I think the best thing I ever did in coaching was admit my ignorance and say, I don't know what I'm doing. And I spoke to the coach of the previous year. And I got the answer that I think is, you'll understand why I say forget about practice. Most coaches would do what I did. I ran great drills. I taught. They ate it up but they didn't get it. So when I asked the coach from the previous year, who was a parent, he said, uh, Wally, I, I don't know a damn thing about hockey. So I never had any practices. Now keep in mind, these were elite young players, the best 13 year olds in a big city. I never had any games, he said. Oh, pardon me, I never had any practices. I had over 140 games, and I just patted him on the back and said, way to go. So that's my point. I woke up, I went back, Craig, and I did nothing but games, varieties of games. I did try to insert some teaching in, but I let them play. And eventually, they got their game back. They discovered the free play and decision making and execution and enjoyment. I was over coaching. And the problem is, if they over coach, and in some cases, you watch practices, Greg, where they're deliberate, they don't run very purposeful, deliberate practices. So if they just played games and patted them on the back at that elite level, so called, they're preparing to, preparing them for. They might be further ahead. Because so my I question. Go ahead. Any other observations? Tim, you're 
like a fly on the wall there. I'm curious about your thoughts on this debate. Cause... So I've got JV hockey players, right? They, they barely know how to skate, most of them. And I'm with you. We, we should be keeping them moving and active. So my whole thing is on puck touches. Like, they're not improving fast enough against playing full ice games where most passes are bouncing off the stick. Like, I, I agree with you, especially at the higher levels, games, games, games. But there's a point where we need to work on actual hard skills because they don't have the ability to execute what's in their brain at all. And there's many ways to go about it and do good quality coaching. If it was higher level, I would be more aptitude to that. But it's such that we we don't have the ability to play hockey yet because the hard skills are not quite up to par. And at this point, I'd rather play three and three cross ice games then go playing full ice five on five games where you're going to touch a puck five, six times. And most of the time you're going to be losing the puck. I'd rather have a lot more puck touches, a lot more activity going on with these kids where they have opportunities to grow. And then we can debate, you know, do you do rote drills? Do you do small area games, et cetera, et cetera. But I just think that the game is not providing enough on a five on five. And we're talking, do you play 12 games or do you play 18 games? How do the parents react to your philosophy? So far, so good. It's the old guy who's uh, around town. But he was actually on the bench for uh, USA at the 2010 Olympics. He's the uh, equipment manager for Team USA Women's. He's with he's a board member of one of the local um, youth organizations, Capital Hockey Association. Tom, in your experience, how do your parents react to your practices? Well, most of the time, really good because most of the time, the team really did well. You know, I know that one double A Bantam team that you helped me with. We had no goalies, like the goalies were horrendous. And we all play teams and lose. And then that one guy whose kid just got drafted, he was always thinking we should be doing skating drills all practice because that's what he did. You know, and he had quite a voice. But uh, it's funny about the goalie though. Like Jim wanted to keep this one goalie. He wasn't that good, but he was a really good athlete, but he'd never been coached. He only took up goaltend the year before. He just finished... Uh, Three years of major junior, he, he became the best goalie of all of them. But he was horrendous that season because he was all over the place. People were shooting basically in open nets. But basically, most of the time, the parents are, you know, they're all in. It all, every, every team has a different dynamic, right? And if you get some parents there that know a lot about one thing, they they're kind of promoting themselves and promoting what they say. Cause this guy took over the next year, the skills for the Royals association and they skate around circles and skate around circles. And one group after the other, it'd be like a plowed field, you know, like the ruts around the circles and stuff, but he really didn't, you know, his kid was a fantastic skater. He just got drafted in the second round by uh, Vegas, I guess it was. And, uh, but, you know, so I guess it depends on the team. Overall, overall, the kids like it and the parents like it and our teams usually do really well. So, you know, don't really have a problem. I've got one question and I've always had this opinion since starting to work with Hockey Canada and doing <clears throat> teaching progressions, Greg, at the beginning level. Uh, the fundamental teaching of holding a stick and whatnot, moving up to passing and puck control. But I believe that's a missing link. But experts are hired to teach that, and better athletes will acquire it without instruction. And some of them could be much better than they are. But the fundamentals are number one to getting a start. So... Tim, I'm thinking of you and, and your, the national teams you've worked with, Canadian women, uh, Denmark, and how you choose to practice in terms of how they play in the games is what matter. So, Tom, I, you just watched all of our national 
teams at a camp practice. You could see what the coaches were doing, and you liked it. I mean, they were doing triple drives with good depth, good execution. Uh, talk a bit about what you watched. Well, I, well, with the with the under eighteen girls, uh, how we worked on defensive, individual defensive skills, an awful lot. You know, and I get. I think he thought he had a bunch of offensive players who he needed to do that. And you know, they ended up uh, winning at the end the world championship. And then the under seventeen was kind of different because there was like six teams there, so it was a little bit of skill. You know, and they weren't concentrating on team play so much. But interesting, they and this happened with them and the eighteen and the twenty. They're trying to get guys you know, like a lot of times they did like a three on oh and they pass the middle of the guy would pass wide and they wanted the wide guy to get in between the dots and then they did you know cross and drops and all kinds of stuff from that and they got so they're doing great in drills but then when we they went to live situations the guys just went down the boards you know just it was it's so ingrained in them to just try to beat someone with speed so there wasn't a lot of great transfer there for them. because every team really pushing that uh, they're really trying to get the puck in the middle right now that's what i saw the middle and then that uh you know pass across in the middle drive to the weak side guy who one times it every every team was doing that a lot and they and they have good skills they hammered it yeah i didn't see them creating a lot of two-on-ones the under 20 or under 18 man they're really a lot of uh Deliberate practice. You know, they didn't get much game situation. Like they, they had progressions in their drills and end up with, you know, uh, situation drills and all this kind of stuff. But it was very deliberate. The under 20, I think, uh, of course, the under 18, they're going to the Helenka Cup next week or something. 120 is getting more ready for the world championships. But they had a lot. I think their practices were a lot more uh, blue, a lot more games. They played some games and contests and shootouts. And I think uh, their practices weren't quite as deliberate, but they had a lot of a lot of game situations because they are preparing. So, you know, I, but I didn't see one thing I did not see at all. There was one cross ice back checking game. But I saw no transition games. You know, basically, the transition games weren't used. And, uh, you know, but the drills were really good. You know, they're good coaches out there. But I thought there was a, a lot of deliberate, you know, coaching kind of. So that, that was my take on I saw, like, uh, all kinds of practices. I've got, like, 150 clips, different things that happened. I'd just like to welcome Sammy. Uh, hi, Sammy. Hope you're on. <laughs> she might be chasing the kids around. But, um, I had a question for you about, if you just take your team, Denmark. You had to plan practices. You're working with a head coach and talking about what you do and what you did. And I thought you must have done some terrific, correct things. Because you got results. And can you speak to that um, in the light of what we talked about? You had to take what you had coming in and work with it and compete. Well, it's hard to, I mean, we're talking about elite levels. We're talking about development levels and, you know, different levels kind of required sort of different approaches in some ways. And. Um, you know, sort of going back to the beginning, I think it's important for everybody to remember that playing 100 games a year is not the answer. And practicing five times as much as you play games is not the answer. There, there needs to be a balance. Kids, kids play the game because it's fun or they want it to be fun, and games are fun. And people like playing games, and there's nothing wrong with that. 
Uh, I think part of the answer might lie in, you know, uh, what people are doing at practice. And um, as you know, we're all big proponents and um, more fun time game time at practice might enhance the enjoyment level both for the parents watching and for the players playing like uh yeah for sure have a little bit of a skill element but then play a whole bunch of games and and as we've talked before hey how about just some free uh shinny time scrimmage time especially for young developing kids like we often get stuck thinking we got to do skills all the time with their little young kids because they got to uh, learn some skills. Um, when, as, as Tom said many times, and we all agree, like in lots of ways, the game is the best teacher. Let them, let them play games. Let them play shinny. Like, you know, you don't see coaches at their formal practices letting kids play shinny anymore. Like, it, it just doesn't happen. We all get so focused on instructing. So it's all... Uh, you know, it's there, there. As I've said a million times, there, there's there are no black and whites. It's not about games. It's not about practice. It's about the balance. And it's a, and you know, and again, as we all agree, it's about having fun and creating fun, um, especially in those practice environments. Because um, practice is fun. You know, it, it's going to be more productive. So, what I what I've found that like. We did this camp in Jasper for years and years, skating hockey, and I put six little nets on the ice because it's very, very goalies hardly ever go to hockey schools and that anymore. They go to the goalie camps, and so we just had six small nets, divide the kids into uh, twelve teams, and then do a skill. Well, that was your practice group, you know, do a skill, and you know the technique, and then play some kind of a game that they had to use that skill in. And I found that that really worked. The kids, after, especially the little kids, after like three, four minutes, they're asking for a game right away. The little kids want to just play. And uh, and we had all age groups on the ice, like from five to 16. So they're all, you know, ability grouped. And I found that a really good template, because I, I use that in phys ed, because I, I would get double classes, so between 45 and 60 kids in a three badminton court sized gym. And uh, there's always six basketball nets and I put extra lines in. So a badminton court, I divide it into two and there'd be six volleyball courts. And we do that, they practice with their group. And I had a round robin tournament schedule on the, on the wall laminated. So, we, you know, maybe we'd practice underhand serve or something like this. And they practice that, do the technique, help each other. And then we play it. We play a game and a time game, like 10 minutes or whatever. And then the winning team, someone from both teams went over, but the winning team would circle, you know, that they won the game. And then we'd rotate like the schedule was there. So they look and see where they were playing. I didn't have to say anything and they get to the next place. And to me seemed to be a great template for teaching things and them having fun and everybody busy all the time. So that was kind of my discovery. Tom, Tom, being I, a phys, basically a phys ed teacher who coaches hockey. Mm -hmm. See Tom, your ability to teach makes it automatic for you. And I, I'm just talking about coaches in general that aren't educated in, in uh, you know, the, the teaching mechanics, the skill analysis, the progression of teaching, and then introducing games. The scope and sequence, that's what teachers have. And um, you have it. So uh, Sammy Joe is on, and I wanted to talk about the female camp I watched they won the gold medal, and I I, I was so impressed with uh, Howie Draper's uh, participation in the Sharks call because he was able to implement a, a culture, create a culture of belief and effort 
not relying on the skill level of the kids as much as their ability to play better together. They did well without the puck, and as the tournament went on, they were exceptional. So, Sammy, can you comment on what we're talking about on the female side? And I don't know how old your daughters are, but they're going to be moving up the ladder here in terms of are they going to be playing more games, too many games? What's the right stuff, right amount, right time in your eyes? Might have left because us guys are dominating. Well, it's, she's muted. Sammy, you're muted if you're there. She also mentioned in the chat that her uh, internet speeds are slow, so she may be having some difficulties there. Okay. Uh, um, I'm just looking forward to the watching the U18s, um, U20s. Like these games are going to be televised and. Tom, you don't go to games because you just love watching practices. But I think the game is the test of what you do at practice. Oh, and for sure. But there's only so much time that I can be away from home. No, but I'm 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 just saying we're trying to make a judgment here in short-term competition. How often do you have them together? What can you work on? Then you got to get them to come together. The challenge, Tim, with the national women's team, let's say the U18s is, oh boy, you're deciding on who's going to play the power play, uh, who's going to penalty kill. They're going to have to accept roles, and the buy-in of the roles they give relative to the way they're utilized might affect them mentally. And I believe that's where Howie's culture, creation of a group culture, paid off immensely. But I, I'm, I'm just looking forward to these championships to see how they play, win or lose, how they perform. And I've got thoughts about how they've done poorly and how they've done well and why might they have done well when they did. And um, I'm just trying to connect how they prepare, how they come together, how they build the team. And, and it's, it's a real important concept because, as Greg mentioned, Winning is the measurement of the result of the purposeful practice being accomplished or the team building being more important than the deliberate purposeful practice. I'm just not sure, but I'm I'm really curious about it. And I'm intrigued about it. So uh, hell is left, but he did mention initially. That it appears that at very young ages, U8, U10, the best players get all the ice time. They um, they get the puck to the best player. That's the offensive strategy. And the way they go, and then when they grow up to the next level, uh, it's not a team game. It appears to be a one-on-one -on -one game, an individual game. So, Tim, have you had to deal with them being too individualistic with the teams you've worked on, whether it's Team Canada or Team Denmark? Mm, not not in a not in a big way. I mean, um, there's obviously times when people need to share the puck a bit better than than they do, or you know, improve the decisions that they're making. But um, no, not not in a real big way. I know it's a concern. Uh, you know, just watching a lot of the younger aged groups and in particular watching you know the midget triple a guys play against our the national women it, it certainly appears that they they have a much more individualist mindset that i'm, I'm going to do it in versus you know moving the puck and sharing the puck and working together but um you know it's a it's a learning process as we all know Greg, have you got anything to add in? I think Greg stepped away too. Oh no, he's. No, I'm still. I'm still here. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Just, just turn the video off. Uh, working along as we go. Um, for for me, it's like, how do you utilize the practice time to have fun? Like that should be the most fun part. Um, so when I'm having these conversations, and it's frustrating to me, 
like we like I, I was at a coach developers for Columbus Blue Jackets. They're taking over rack hockey, which is house hockey in Columbus, the youngest ages. And I was talking with um, paired off and we're going and all this. And one person's like, oh, yeah, you do work for the first 30 and then you have fun and do games for the last 30. Like, why do, why do you even do the fun in the first place, especially for 8U? I, I really want to question that part because I'm pretty sure <laughs> – with eight-year-olds, if you haven't done it before, it's it's kind of like herding cats. Just keeping them moving is probably a decent strategy rather than we have to do work with these kids. So, sorry, I'm, I'm coming from the exact opposite end today of maybe some high performance with you 17th and 18th and starting with uh, the very basics and the very lowest standards of hockey um, and how do we go about developing whether that be the young or the high school team working out where they're the underskilled and we need to get them up to par and access to more skills and utilization of skills um, so they can actually implement them and be able to think and utilize tactics along with those skills so yeah, I'm, I'm, to hear from you guys on that yeah i'm certainly not an expert in the uh, youth youth sport area, having not spent a lot much time at all coaching at that level, but I think you know Wally can speak to it a bit. But you know, um, Sam Holmes working with girls hockey Calgary uh, here at the very youngest levels. You know, she's she's really found some success and um, with the, with the kids. Like really, you know, if you think about it and you think about it from a, a child's mindset. You know, having a half hour of uh, skill or, or quote unquote work and then half hour of um, fun and games is a good idea, but it's an even better idea to say, okay, first seven or eight minutes, this is what we're going to do. We're going to work on this skill and then we're going to play a game. And like Tom was saying, and hopefully you, you can, even if you can't organize yourself well enough to you know, work on a skill and then ask sort of for it in the game. It depends what age level you're working for. But uh, uh, a more um, more of a mix of eight, ten minutes on a skill, eight, ten minutes on a game. Eight, ten minutes on a skill, eight, ten minutes on a game. The, the short-term focus uh, Sam has found is really important and effective for the young, young girls or the young players. And I think it would be universally so that, hey, we're, you got to focus on this for a l little short period of time, try to get better skill wise. And we're going to play this game. I, I think I think that's one kind of easy thing, maybe um, um, to change about how a lot of people run their practices. Tim, I, I'm thinking back to the U8 uh, uh, days. Working in Medicine Hat, where we mentored that association, and we used Kerry Bracco's model. And for those of you who aren't on, I'm not going to explain the details of the model. I just want to tell everybody who might be listening. Uh, when you win nine of 11 city championships at the U8 level, whole ice hockey, you've done something right. The kids were selected properly based on skill, intangibles, work ethic, coachability. They had three traits, skill, thinking, and in character. They uh, looked at those things and evaluated them, picked them accordingly, placed them accordingly. So when you get results, the model, uh, Tim, they had one skill station where the three skill <coughs> groups, Eagles, Hawks, and Falcons, different skill groups, they rotated through the skill station, the compete station, and the game-like station, 10 minutes each, 12 minutes each at most. So they didn't get bored. And Ryan always mentioned his son called it the boring station, that skill station. They love the other one. So the results to me speak for that model. So the ratio of deliberate practice to game-like, Tim, I'm, I'm wondering if you play a game first, can you dial them back? To work on the skill, or are sure. they losing? Yeah. No, I think sure, sure you can. And you know, I know Tom, and you know, like even at the national team level, some days we go out and just 
play a game right off the right off the top um because it's fun to get some excited get some into practice then you step back and you start working on some things and go back to the game i, I think for sure uh, and lot, lots of ways it might be the best thing especially for the young kids to go out and have some pure fun right off the top at practice um they all get excited about getting on the ice and uh, they all get excited about being at practice i think absolutely for sure I think well, it's actually probably a good idea, not just um, a sometimes thing. It's it's fantastic. I start with small area games every single practice, and instead of the kids like moseying out, they're like climbing through the door as fast as they can, wanting to tear down the boards sure. to get on the ice. Sure. That's what is Carrie named Pat- Horst Wine. There's a German named Horst Wine that developed the program for Barcelona and all kinds of stuff. It was field hockey, then soccer. And he was a good friend of Johanny, my, my buddy. And he would do what said there is he, he would have a a game with some kind of a rule, like you can only use your left foot to kick or something like this. And they, they'd play. And then he had what was called corrective exercises. They now that now you've created a need to know because you know the kids don't know how to do it or you're right you know your weak side foot i guess hey eh? and then have you uh drills you know to learn how to do that better technique and then go back to the same rule again but now they've had you know a little bit of uh technique work and that that that's kind of his model for doing a lot of things but i really i really believe that just uh having a tournament and every game meaning something you know that that adds a lot to it. So you you have a tournament like a round robin, or you can do a oh, one where you you rotate the losers go one way, the winners go the other way. You know stuff like that, so that the game actually means something. I think really is that adds to it just as well. Tim, I'm thinking back to when I watched you coach the UFC. It was the most remarkable competitive scrimmage I've ever seen because you had broke down positive plays in each zone that you awarded them points on. I don't know if you recall or not, but at the collegiate level, the players were focusing on tactical strategies to advance the puck up the ice, and they got points for doing correct things there can you elaborate on that because they loved it they played but boy talk about playing with a deliberate purpose to score and get more points in every zone of the ice it it, it was it was really just that simple like we just tried to if we were working on something um tactically you know could be could be we're working on our face-off offensive zone face-off loss for check or and at the same time our our exits from a defensive zone face-off one it could be working on your just your general four check whatever it is we we always as much as we could try to create a bit of a point system that that made it a game and made it competitive and you had a winner and a loser um like like just on a, you know, it's really, you can do any, anything you want, but on a very simple level, like if we're doing a, a face-off situation, it's like, okay, number one, and first and foremost, you get a point if you win the face-off, win possession. And then when you go beyond that, if the defensive team gets a clean exit um, with possession of the puck, they might get two points. If they get a clean exit with a, uh, chip out into the neutral zone because that's what's required sometimes and that's the correct play. Um, rather than have them thinking about, I got to carry it out to get my two points and my point for possession, you want to leave them with choices as the game is about choices. So we give them a point for winning the face off and a point for at least getting the puck out of the zone, uh, two points or possessing the puck out of the zone. You can even go a step further and play it to the red line, and if they can gain the red line or gain the offensive blue line, 
you can go further. And then on the offensive side, same thing. You win the faceoff, you get a point. If you generate a shot on net, and if it's your coaching philosophy, you generate a shot on net in the first five seconds, you get another point. And then if you can recover possession and keep possession, you get another point. So it's just about, you know, enhancing the competitiveness of the what's really a tactical drill situation and making it a game so there's a competitive element. And it was, yeah, we we done it with the Danish team and um, I'm not sure how much we did it back in the day with the women's national team, certainly on occasion. Um, but yeah, so it's it's just creating a game out of what might be a bit of a drier, um, from the player's point of view, just a little bit of a drier situation. Tim, uh, you, know, you got to have a, you got to have a, you got to have obviously some support staff, uh, somebody watching the defensive team, somebody watching the offensive team for points, and then ideally, if you have like four coaches, you could have one coach then watching the offensive team, sort of from a tactical learning, constructive feedback perspective. Same thing with the breakout team, but you, you need people uh, just keeping score as well, just because it's tough. To do it all, Tim. I, I've got a, a request here. We've asked the same thing. Um, we had one a long while ago with Daryl Belfry about doing something, asking questions only. He hasn't come back to us on it. But what I would like you to do, Tim, if, could you create a template by zone where you could score points in print that I'd be able to share with people? Um, because when you described it through each zone, I'm sure, uh, given your analytical mind, coaches could take one thing in each zone or two things in each zone and keep score. It would be the right amount for the ki- uh, players to digest at that level. Maybe when you're playing with minor hockey kids, say uh, U12, you might have one thing in each zone. Uh, with Greg being on, I go back to Alan Andrews. He had one rule that I call it, call it a cardinal rule. And at any level, if a player is open, you must head man the puck. If you don't, you're carrying it. You're slowing the attack down. So he reinforced that. That's That to me is an automatic two-point thing. And if you don't do it, it's a address issue to the point where it have happened second, third times, it might be an ice time issue. Because that to me is what's lacking in minor hockey kids. They carry it when people are available ahead of them and they don't learn to respect the importance of the pass being quicker than you can skate the puck. So So. if if you could think about that, Tim, I, I might request it of you again down the road because it's, it was a brilliant idea at, I'm thinking at any level, but particularly the university level where they're working with all these guys and yeah, you have your structure, you have your team play and I'm watching all these teams play and it's still individualistic and the puck movement isn't as advanced as it could be. It's not as uh, one, two, three, four, five positionally, but Anyway, I want to welcome Brian Adolski. Brian, we've been talking about the right stuff, right amount, right time at practice, translating into the games. And uh, we feel that over the years, the strategy, Hal mentioned it earlier, was just get the best player of the puck, still look after it, and you might get an outcome result by having the best players get the puck more often. And to me, they're not ready to play a high level of hockey when they get to your level and you're, you know, you've been at a high level. So, Brian, any thoughts? Well, we're losing people. we got to try to get them on. Brian is muted, too, if you're there, Brian. But I think, I think, Greg, uh, were you trying to jump in there after... Yeah, I've got an interesting uh, story. So in my town in Cleveland, I had a uh, guy who's the all-time WHA leading goal scorer, Andre Lacroix, if anyone remembers that name. Yeah. And uh, 
he has a very interesting thing that I I've picked up and I have yet to ask him about, but he will not pass you the puck unless you're moving. doesn't matter if you're all the way at the far blue line wide open. He will not pass you the puck unless you're moving. So maybe it's not always great to headman the puck. There's some conditions that need to be met as well. Um, he, he's, he's very adamant. I've noticed him do that. I, at first I thought it was an accident. And then I realized that he was doing it on purpose. Cause I think he was nicknamed like the wizard or something like that. The magician. Cause he had great hands and vision and he would not pass you the puck unless you were moving. Like you had to at least have some sort of momentum. Yeah. And I, and I always, I always have a, because hockey is such a fluid read and react kind of game. I always, I always have a bit of difficulty, uh, you know, saying to a player, you must do this um, in almost any situation. Um, you know, so I, I, I always stop to think hard uh, if I'm going to tell somebody they have to do something in a, in a certain situation. It takes the game out of their hands to some degree. Um, and I agree with you, Wally, though, on the, on the, you know, that there needs to be more encouragement for puck movement and puck sharing and you know, playing games where you get points for, you know, the number of passes you complete uh, is is a beneficial thing too. Like the more complete passes you tape to tape, um, you control the pass. Uh, premium on goal scoring, of, of of course. Like so, if you're getting a point for every pass you make, you might say if you score a goal, you get five. If you're talking about a game. So they, they don't forget that the game is about scoring. <laughs> Tim, I have, I have an example on this, actually. Yeah. Um, so a way you can do it is each goal is worth one, but every pass that precedes that goal, successfully completed, whether it be tape to space, tape to tape, whatever it may be, adds a point. So a goal could be worth five because you made four passes beforehand. So say someone makes a great pickoff and they're on a breakaway, well, they're not going to make a gazillion passes. They're going to go and still play the game to score, but you're not saying you have to make three passes before getting a shot on net. You're still allowing for the game to be played. You're just incentivizing further passing. So it's, it's, uh, it's exactly what you're saying. And I, and I love it because you're saying, Hey, we want to play the game. We want to still be aggressive. We want to transition quickly. But if that's maybe not available, we want to start finding different ways to work the puck around to find a better look. So instead of saying you have to do this, it's an incentive and it just adds up rather than goals worth five, pass the first one, and you're just getting, you know, goals for points for passing back and forth. Good point, Greg. I, I just want to give you a simpler idea. When I was at the under 18 camp, I sat with a an older fellow, about younger than me, but he, we got talking hockey, and he shared an idea that I'm going to share with everybody here that is simpler than any of us have described, that anybody can do. And he said when he played soccer, he did it, and he told hockey coaches about it. Buy a counter. Have a counter in your hand. Every time a pass is made, keep track of the number of passes. His story was the hockey coach who did it, their team became a, one of the better passing teams. Other coaches were asking the coach or coming up to the coach and saying, boy, they play like the Russians. What did you do? That's all he did. He just kept track of passes. They were conscious that when they made more passes, they were getting better results. And it just mushroomed. So that's a simple way. Like I'm thinking we can do everything we're all talking about. We do everything we're all talking about. What does the coach do? Any coach can have a counter. Any coach can pat a kid in the back and say way to go and not demoralize them by their approach, by their yelling and telling and maybe telling them wrong things. So it's that simple. Uh, Hell, your hand. And then I want to get Sammy if she's yeah. on, and Brian if he's on too. Yeah, that was that was. I think that's a good uh, idea. Well, I, a few years ago, a number of years ago, I took uh, Jim Johnson and I put together a, a net effectiveness a scoring system for for players and games. Um, 
and it, it was as I think as Greg was talking, you get you got points assigned for doing good things, and but you also got minuses for doing bad things, like you know taking too many penalties and things like that. But it was the idea of it was, and uh, Wally, I I'll send you a I'll send you a copy of it. It's on a Excel spreadsheet. It takes a little bit of work because you got to go through and 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 got to look at the video uh, and and grade every player. Um, but it's also based on the idea that not everybody's going to score goals, uh, and you know there there are certain values for things that players can do. Um, one is blocking shots. Uh, and if forwards block shots on the uh, on the PK, that's really valuable. That's that's more valuable than if the defenseman blocks the shot, and so on and so forth. So you, you know, we modified it for high school level. Uh, Jim was using it when he was coaching the American Hockey League, and it made a huge difference um, because now every kid or every player on your team, you know, they can all do something. To contribute to the success of the team, whatever their skill set is, um, and you know, some guys aren't going to block shots. I mean, you know, Ovechkin's not going to block shots if he can help it. Coach probably doesn't want him to, but uh, you know, that third line, you know, wing certainly can. I mean, there are lots of things, and, and I'll I'll share that uh, to the group if you want to look at it while they see. and if you want to share it, fine. Um, it does take a fair amount of work to do it. Somebody's got to take the stats and they got to be, they have to be, you know, as we know about stats, they're always wrong, but as long as they're wrong consistently in the same, in the same way, <laughs> meaning the same people are doing it all the time and interpret things. And, um, you know, it's pretty interesting when we used it, uh, we would post it once a week. So there'd be a couple games worth. And the kids always went in and wanted to take a look at it and see how they were doing, and 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 if and then that was, and then it allows the coach to have a conversation around things that they can do a little more of, or you know, so on and so forth. And of course, the kids that really aren't doing anything, they wouldn't go look at the stats, which is also kind of interesting because they know that they're not. They're not contributing very much. And it wasn't because they weren't playing, because they were all playing. We always, we played everybody. I'm not, nobody sits on my bench and not play. So anyways, so uh, who else wants to pitch in on the ice, Sammy? Hmm. Hey, Brian, you one? Brian, both Brian and Sammy uh, have, have shared that they're, like Sammy's in Halliburton, so she's got a really slow internet, so I'm not sure. Uh, how much she can participate. Same thing with Brian. Um, he, he's, he doesn't, his microphone's not working in his office there. So, okay. Um, but I, I, I want to just sort of just reiterate again, whether it's Wally's example of the coach who just literally counted the number of pra uh, passes the teams were making during scrimmage or during a drill or something like that. Um, or whether it's our other example about creating a point system in a drill to enhance the fun and competitive um, <clears throat> aspect of, of the drill itself. Um, what it is, is it's, it's quantifiable feedback for the players. Hey, you're, you know, you just did this drill and you, you had 60 passes. Now we are playing the same game for the same amount of time. And this time you had 85. It's, it's a quantifiable, um, concrete feedback to the players which is always useful um in terms of creating interest and and identifying you know progress and development and everything else but is it they're just there's so if you know even with the danish women just some blatantly obvious examples of where we added a point element a competitive element to a simple passing drill where it really enhanced the uh, the execution of the drill. Simple simple cross and drop pass drill, which we felt, I think I may have shared this before, but 
you know, we're we're trying to be pretty creative and uh, have five five player offense, the offensive zone. Part of being able to do that effectively is to be able to make effective drop passes and you know faking drop passes and that sort of thing. So we had a really really simple sort of double drop pass drill that uh, we did consistently, and after, and and we were not. We could not make a, a good, effective, proper drop pass initially. Um, we gave instruction, but when, but when we introduced, hey, hey, draw us a little circle on the ice, a five-foot circle. If you can stop the puck and keep the puck in this circle for somebody crossing behind you, you get a point for that. And we're going to have a competition, red against white. As soon as we did that, Bang! Our development sort of went on a steep upward trajectory because they were really focusing on the, the skill that we had obviously demonstrated and been practicing. So it's just a pretty good example of, you know, the point system is feedback for whether you're doing well or not doing well. And feedback is always sort of welcome and useful. I, I put my hand up here. Hal, I don't know if you still wanted to share an idea, no. but um, Tim, back in the late 70s, working for Hockey Canada, Quebec was ahead of the curve at teaching progressions. And they did a cross-drop progression, slow and deliberate, that was unbelievable. At the time, it was like, one of those, oh my God. And it was so simple, but it's something that has to be taught deliberately and progressively. And basically they, they went down the ice fairly wide in pairs and the puck carrier crossed in front of the other player who crossed behind. And it was sort of wide, so it was slow and deliberate. They had to cross flat. They had to leave a dead puck so that the receiver could pounce on it. And then the receiver went across, and then they both did a cross drop again, the exchange being the crosser and the dropper. And that timing, the ability to be flat, leave a dead puck, not put a tail on it and throw it away at that time, beginning level we're, we're talking peewee bantam here it it paid off so it's something i adapted and i think it's you know your girls got it doing it from you know the way you did it but i think for minor hockey coaches greg i'm thinking of your young kids at what age would you teach a deliberate cross drop i don't know if you're still on craig but that's a question yeah. i'll throw at you so the way that I work this um, is I actually use video. So I show video examples. So uh, just a compilation of different scenarios that cross and drop happened or we're attacking vertically rather than horizontally ways that they're creating these two on ones on a two V two. Um, actually, I like to show that one first is how do we attack one defenseman, one person go behind one person at front. So I use the videos to prime them, and then I'll just play a two-on-two -two continuous game where you're playing offense, defense, then out, and you're just getting a ton of looks at those 2v2. So it's less deliberate, more of filling their brains with ideas and letting them problem solve. Like, I don't want to give them the solution. I want to present problems and give them potential solutions and then let them understand the cues and working off of their teammates. I like that, Craig, uh, the use of video and then play a game. You said two versus two, eh? Yeah, yeah. I like to do 2v2 because it's it's simple enough, um, but it's uh, complex enough. Like, I don't want to go to three on three or anything yep. more yep, right. than that because then it's just too much coming at them. I want to just start very simple. I think 2v2s are kind of the basis <clears throat> of the rest of the team play. I got a – I just had a – an idea about what you said and I can throw it out to everybody. I've got a, a really nice continuous two on one drill that, uh, 
comes from a progression from the checks on teaching drive drive skating with uh, Royal Road deceptive pass shooting shoot for whatever but I would I'm thinking I would do your drill Craig in a two on one where they can only score off a cross and drop any place on the ice direct attack coming off the wall whatever that's it's a great idea I think the visualization of it I believe kids will get sooner than the deliberate practice. I, I think that's. I, I, I think the key here is we're prescribing problems for them to solve rather than prescribing them solutions to the yeah. problems okay. that'll be presented. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we get back to Ken Brackle, who didn't coach. He just cheered them. <laughs> they solve problems themselves. And they got pretty darn good at it. So I'm wondering to what degree the average coach should do that. And the elite coach like ourselves should think about not doing so much. There's that balance, as Tim said, between right stuff, right amount, right time, and Tim's added the right way. I think that's the art of coaching, and that's sort of what we're striving for. So... Sammy and Joe, if you get your mic working and ever want to jump in, go ahead. We sure appreciate it. So, so Wally, um, I think a lot of that is really good. Uh, uh, you know, and I think one of the things we're talking about is how do we how do we bridge this this gap of knowledge, you know, and 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 and, and give it to the kids or the young players. Uh, so they can solve problems. And I think that the, uh, at least my experience, and I think I shared a little bit, you know, when it, an earlier one with the girls, is they don't, they don't actually know what the problem is. So it's hard to solve a problem and, and without defining what the problem is. And then, then asking them. So like the one we were talking about before was this zone entry thing. And, you know why do the why does the why does the wing take the puck and just attack up wide with speed and then they have a big collision on at, you know at, at, at the hash marks or in the corner with the defenseman because that's all they've ever really thought about. And we also know that teenagers uh, help you know their frontal lobes aren't uh, perfectly formed yet and um, they don't. They don't step back to kind of look at things. So when I asked the girls, they said, well, we're, I, all I think about is getting around that girl. I go, well, okay. Um, how about, so, so you're skating at her. Why don't we go, why don't you skate somewhere where she has a problem to solve and that's how is she going to deal with you? Because you're, you're taking all the decision of ma making away from your opponent because they can see exactly what you're going to do. So why don't you do something a little bit different? And what do you think would work? And then we got into lots of different ideas. So I think um, with younger players, and uh, it sounds like Greg's coaching JV uh, kids like I am now, um, it, you got to help them understand what the problem is. and. Let, let them suggest, or maybe you suggest two or three solutions and let them figure it out um, and then reward them um, when they actually do it, not only in practice, but uh, I had kids last year coming back to the off, uh, onto the bench going, hey, did you see I did that big 90 out there? Or hey, did you see that escape move I made? And I go, that was really cool. And did you see what happened afterwards? They go, yeah, it really works. And so uh, now these are younger players. Those are 15 year old girls last year, 14, 15 year old girls. So every group of kids, and Tim, you said it earlier, every group of kids is different. Every age level is different. So we have to coach to whatever the hockey IQ of the group is. And, um, you know, if, if, if we would like to teach uh, calculus, but if they're still in basic math, then we got to go back. We got to. We have to lower ourselves down and help them build those those 
those incremental steps uh, that they need to eventually. I've always said to the kids, my goal is that you become your own coach. Yeah. That you can look out on the ice and see what you need to do and how to do it. And, uh, and if you need help or you need resources, ask for them. Um, and I think a lot of the high-end players eventually, uh, eventually do that. But most of us aren't coaching high-end players. Okay. So. <laughs> well, I think, Hal, uh, you've nailed it. Um, I, we've had a professor on before who said, when you are trying to solve problems, how do you get kids to solve problems? What's the normal way of doing that? Everybody. We tell them what to do. Well, the Socrates method is ask them, what do you think? And that's yeah. what we need to do. We, we have to coach with, with the Socrates method. And we have to learn to ask more questions. It takes more time because traditionally, We've been directors, we've been tellers and yellers. And I don't think the coaches are aware of the, the myriad of options that are available to be taken advantage of. And advanced players are, and those advanced players are 10 and 12 years old if you let their brains work. And I think that's where the overcoaching comes in and if it's misdirected coaching it can be detrimental to development and not much fun and kids are quitting as we know so good point well, you, i think what you said it, Hal, is, is the way to teach them how to think is to ask them questions and so whether we get back to um getting daryl belfry on and I wanted him to talk about something he had talked about, but only the asking of questions. Okay. Because he's sort of a master of it in his book. He talks about working with those elite players like Matthews and Marner and discovering what they want to do. He's got an idea in his mind, and he knows he can take them out of their comfort zone, but he draws it from them. And they respond very well. That's why he's such a sought after commodity. The elite players love the freedom of thinking for themselves. So I think it's uh, there's something so to be learned at the highest level, <clears throat> to be learned at the youngest level. So, so Wally, I think that you know when we're coaching younger players, and you you know and you're a bench coach which of course we all know is a very different proposition than, than being up, up above and watching. And I know a lot of coaches and I was guilty of it for many years is when they come back to the bench and say, well, why didn't you, why didn't you make that pass? Well, the problem is we got, you know, on the bench, you got the worst seat in the house. And, and especially if it's something at the offensive blue line, you're probably looking through two panes of glass and there's a thing uh, called the uh, parallax distortion and uh, when you're looking at things at an angle especially if you're screaming about an offsides call that happened 60 feet away at an angle you probably you're probably wrong and um, so if you start asking questions of kids Rather than why you, you should have passed it to Billy, the question should be, what did you see? Yeah. That's then, the best question in hockey by far, rather than why didn't you then, pass to X, Y, and Z? Because then you get to understand exactly where they are in the process. Like, is it an execution uh, oh, issue or is it a processing or gathering of information? So maybe we didn't see, maybe we failed to pick up relevant information. Love that, Hal. Yep. No, oh, you're right, Greg. I and mean, that's, that is, I didn't, I didn't see them. Oh, well, let, let's work on, on your, would you be willing to work on seeing more around you? Cause the game will be more fun to play. Well, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's do that. <laughs> how, or, many, how many coaches say, do you know can do that? 
How many coaches do you <laughs> know can do that? We know it's the thing to do. We're struggling with it ourselves. I'm not even oh. coaching. It takes time. So what I'm suggesting is, who's the most important adult on the bench? Anybody? Well, probably the assistant coach. Okay. In minor hockey, who's the most important on the bench? Because Usually, there's an adult opening and closing the gates. And you want that person to be the most positive person mm -hmm. on your staff. Because those kids are going out feeling positive because they go by him and coming off the ice because they're greeted by them, him or her. That's it. As far as asking questions go, oh, theoretically, this is the ideal, but it's just be positive no matter what you do, because we may not do the right amount. We may not have time to ask questions and listen. So the posit power of positivity there at minor hockey, that idea on the bench is something I picked up from another coach years ago. And it came up now. It's worth reminding listeners of. Hell, I have a question. Um, there seems to be a, prevail a prevalent uh, trend with players standing up on the bench for the entire game. And I see it in college. You don't see it in the pros. I, I'm told they have... It, their contract says they have to sit on the bench so the fans can see. <laughs> the fans in the first row behind them can see. Um, but, you know, so the, the players stand and the coaches all stand on the bench. And when, you know, if you've got a, a full roster, you know, the, 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 the skaters coming off have to find a place to crawl, you know, to step over the boards. And the player going on, I mean, to me, it's a mess. I don't, I don't let my players stand up. I make them sit down on the bench because I tell them that they need the rest. And uh, but I, I am actually kind of astounded that I see it constantly when I go to the junior games. And some of them are not only, or they, or they lean forward. They put their knees on the wall and they, and they hang over, and their sticks are hanging over. And then when anything happens, they all jump up and start kicking, kicking the, the wall. And I see USA Hockey now has a rule against that. And um, it's like, it's weird. I don't, is, is this happening up in Canada? Hell, they, I think they're sitting on the benches in Canada, but on the positive side of standing, they're engaged in the play. But yeah. what you described is overly engaged. Yeah. Uh, they're they're not recovering physiologically by sitting, and then their intensity, their level of arousal is higher because they got to get into it. And I don't yeah. think their ability to see the game and and execute when they get out there is in keeping with always standing on the bench. Yep. And and I think you're you're absolutely right. I don't believe that's ever been a problem, Tom, with you and any team you've coached. Uh, usually, the next lineup might stand at the door, but I think I, they tend and kids tend to stand and not sit. Okay, a lot of it's because the way that you know the benches are, you can't see. Yeah. So, so you're okay with them standing? Uh, I don't even think about it. <laughs> I think it's yeah. kind of messy myself, but I don't know. <laughs> like, I I think it's better to sit when you get on the bench, especially if you yeah. work really hard. You should sit down, and you know. But if you can see, sometimes the benches are made. Yeah, they're like the ones that sit. The bench is far back from the board. 
and then mm. and then uh, you really can't see much of anything unless right you kind of. Uh, I get you know, I like to get that they come off and they turn around and put their butt on the rail <laughs> and they're they're sitting on the rail. <laughs> Go ahead. Come on, get back over here a little bit. Well, they might get hit. You know, the play yeah, comes well, down, they can't see it. They might get hit. <laughs> so, but whatever. <laughs> I don't know. Choose our battles. <laughs> anybody else have an issue with that or how do you deal with it or do you just let it be? Craig? I let it be. I don't. I don't choose that battle. I know some coaches that care, and it's part of the culture, and that's fine. I prefer sitting. Um, I just think it's cleaner, neater for everyone involved. But I, I'm not hard policing that one at all. Tim, any issues sitting or standing on a bench, or you just don't worry about it? Uh, mute. You're muted, Tim. Uh, I think, the, you know, you got to allow the players to do what they're comfortable doing. You can't control them. Um, you know, if they're, somebody's had a really tough, long shift, hey, I let them sit on the bench. If they're excited, they're into the game, let them stand up. I, 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 I've never been um, a real proponent of trying to force anything on, on them one way or the other. <sighs> The one thing I, I notice, and it's not really, it's a different kind of dynamic. <clears throat> I see the players sitting in the middle that never get on the ice. Yeah, they're sitting on the bench. Yeah. And I think that's a problem. Um, that to me is a serious problem. Whether you sit or stand, oh, it might be a detail. But I think if you address it and you get address it strongly, you might be anal about it. You might turn off your players. Right. There is a safety factor. There is a recovery factor. And there is a motivational factor. Of you're on your feet. You want to get out there and do something. So um, I'm more concerned with bench management. And I know there are players who are in, sitting in the middle of the bench for the entire third period or half a game at, at elite levels. And in minor hockey, the third periods are pretty common, limited ice time. Mm. So those kinds of things, to me, yeah, they're, they warrant attention because they're ruining the game. Oh. I believe that what Hockey Canada is going through now, the problem isn't what happened today. It's what happened when they were growing up and those that sat on the bench were depressed and probably quit. And those that got out all the time became entitled, superior people and athletes who do what they want. And I'm being overly... Um, you know, I'm, I'm criticizing that overly because the issues that we're facing now are a product of that evolution of how they've been raised and coached and entitled to be heroic and dominant and do what they want. So education for this has to be done sooner than later, starting with you, hockey, right up to the highest performance level. That's the issue. It's not the incident. Address it reactively. Address it proactively. That's the issue. Sorry for preaching, but I'm getting My only issue with, with the kids sit, standing up is then I have to stand on the bench. And some of the benches are, uh, <laughs> my balance isn't so good anymore. The good is if I fall, I'm going to fall on top of them. But uh, <laughs> I won't have to fall very far. <laughs> this is but then I can't see the game. If they stand up, I have to stand up higher than them. <laughs> I have a funny story related to that, Hal. I'm mentoring, standing. There's three tiers. The coaches at the top on a bench that wasn't screwed in very well. 
And then the players in the middle row and the players in the front row. And this is at Stu Papard Arena, Tom. Yeah. The head coach, who I'm standing beside, lost his balance and banged his head. Oh, that was geez. 15 years ago. He suffered, uh, hasn't been able to go back to work in a concrete way since, and he's still in the middle of a lawsuit over that. The arena and the fact that bench was unstable causing him to fall. So, you know, there's a safety factor there. And, you know, I'd be cognizant of that. The safety factor overrides everything else, whether it's players sitting on the boards or sticker sticks are extended, getting on and off so you don't hurt yourself or hurt the person coming in. One thing about changing and Tim, this is where I have a cardinal that <clears throat> let the player off the ice if you can. Like, don't try to both go through the gate at the same time. Have some kind of a a rule of change so that there's no collisions. But anybody got anything else on this? Yeah, well, I talking about that. Saint used to have the bench at the other side, you know, opposite the the penalty box, and but there was a long bench, but there was about two feet in between, like for some reason, maybe for people to walk through. But I remember one game I was walking down the bench, I was going down to talk to D or something, and I stepped in that hole and oh. I, because you know, the bench and you whack into the bench. <laughs> well, the Colorado Avalanche don't go by the that rule of letting the player off first. Uh, they, they get they get the player out uh, 10, 15 seconds before the player. <laughs> so they avoid the collision. Yeah. Well, Tim, years ago, Andy Murray used a phrase with the national team, cheat on the change. And <laughs> cheat on the change. Yeah. Is, is Colorado cheating on the change? Because what's the legal limit? Well, there's a big to who about them. Well, their game-winning their game-winning goal in Game Five, they had too many players on the ice, and it's clear as day. And the cadres in the middle of the ice receiving a pass. McKinnon's not even off the ice yet. That, that's that's uh, that's I don't know. There's cheating, and then there's being stupid about how you cheat, and then yeah, crazy. Well, I talked to Andy Murray about it. I said, Andy, we can't teach kids to cheat, you know, and I'm. I'm more more concerned about minor hockey, but if the NHL level are modeling this early change to gain an advantage, but I thought the referees had a legal limit of judgment to make on calls like that. And it's something that I think ha ha has to be addressed. It's, uh, I know I, I, you know, with, with Andy, I, I argued pro, you know, really a lot about it because Hockey Canada, you're setting an example for the game with the teams you have and how you coach and how they play. So the cheating on the change uh, I brought to his attention and uh, I've always, you know, you want them to be early and get out there as early as they can, but the idea of cheating, you've got to get called. There has to be an understanding of it. So, good good stories. Um, uh, too many men on the ice. Whose fault is it? It's nobody. It's, it's 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 totally individual to the situation. Coaches could be at fault. Players could yep. be at fault. Could be the player coming on. Could be the player going off. They're all different, and they're all possible. Yep. It's true. How do you address it when you get a penalty like that, Tim? Depends what depends what happened, I guess. Um, you know, if it was somebody, well, if it's somebody not paying attention on the bench, uh, yeah, like you just uh, there's there's different, uh, like you say, there's uh, four or five different scenarios that can arise, but. Um, you know, lot, lots of times it's an honest mistake, and yep. there's not there's nothing to be done in terms of 
a consequence unless it it's happening multiple times. Yeah. There's a consequence if the coach is guilty uh, yeah. too many yeah. times. And <laughs> that's my that's my point. The, the coach, uh, the defensive coach or the offensive coach, that's their baby. And if it happens yeah. as a head coach, to me, it's on them first. Because I think what happens most in minor hockey is the player jumping on, a puck comes there and they grab it. You know, like they, they get the pass before the other player's off, and if they didn't, the referee wouldn't call it. So kind of be aware. aware well, I think it's a chance to score, score a shorthanded goal myself. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Oh boys, let's go get a goal now. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely definitely not always the coach's fault. It can be, and certainly is in lots of situations. But the yeah. the players are um, equally guilty as they were in that Colorado example for sure. They know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. You know, they they push the boundaries as far as they can push them, and they get called, and then they 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 both pull back. Mm -hmm. oh, boys, I got to run. This is fun. I love it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I got to run too. Before you guys leave, I want to tell you that next week, uh, Gardner McDougall has agreed to come on. He was the head coach of the Memorial Cup winning team, a 20-year coaching veteran of CIS hockey and great success. And his story yeah. is in itself very interesting, taking over a team that got beat out of the um, – uh, playoffs in the Q, QHL and the coaching staff was fired and he took over and took them to the Memorial Cup. So that's going to be on and I just wanted to let you all know before you left, Tim, I, I was at Wadena at a reunion and one of the uh, the two parents of the head coach of Colorado were there and I got to spend with the time talking hockey with the dad every day and it was I got some inside scoops to share later about the uh, ups and downs of the coaching at that level and dealing with players at that level and uh, but it was a great great time going home so uh, to, uh, Tim, you sent that notice to Brian. I don't know if he's able to jump in or not, but we certainly invite it if he is. Yeah, he's he's on. He's I think he's listening, but he doesn't have a, a microphone working in his office just yet. You know, oh. he's he's back at. Uh, he just got the job at St. Cloud there a while, just a while back. So he's probably as busy as hell. But good to see you jump on, Brian. And I got to jump off as well. And unfortunately, I'm going to be in Lake Louise next week, so I'll have to look forward to the highlights. I'll record the whole thing and edit it, Tim. Yeah. So I'll send you the entire thing, and I'm going to edit it, just like I'm taking notes now, separate section on bench management and the foibles of it, <laughs> standing or sitting, and and then early changes came in as well. So um, great, great topic today, guys. Um, so I think it's... We're pretty good here, an hour and a half. Uh, I've got lots of work to do editing it, and I have my daughters here getting the house ready. Tim, will see, we'll see you at the football game on Saturday. Looking forward to it. Yeah, it should be a good one. Payback game. Okay. Yeah. Take, Take care. care, Tim. Take care. See you, Tom. See you, Brian. See, see you, Tom. See you, Brian. Bye-bye.